It was a classic script made for the old silver screen. A story of action, suspense, and adventure with a made-for-Hollywood ending. A heartthrob named Brad made a city fall in love with a lightning. A valiant prince whose name is Vince was crowned a star in front of the hockey universe. A once mortal man named Marty became a superhero who saved his team from defeat. It was from Russia with love that Nick came to Tampa to one day rule the hockey world. Life was all rosy for the boyish looking Ruslan who grew up in the biggest moments of the playoffs. And finally a man named Dave believed in the fairy tale and discovered that dreams do come true. It was a picture perfect season that ended with the Lightning as champions. We tell it again on Sunshine. On June 7th, Lord Stanley's Cup was ready for its grand entrance to the St. Pete Times Forum, where it was welcomed with unbridled joy by lightning heroes of all ages, who performed many critical roles in the team's championship effort. For a team that thrived on significant efforts from so many, it was a fitting scene that each lightning player got his hands on the cup. Together, they shared the pain and sacrifice to achieve a title. Together, they shared the prize with a community lifted by the Lightning's drive for the cup. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Tampa Bay Lightning 2004 Stanley Cup Special here on Sunshine Network. I'm Rick Peckham, along with a Chief Bobby Taylor and Paul Kennedy, the usual cast of characters <laughs> here for our look back, a rather cinematic look back at a championship season that, obviously, Chief, none of us are ever going to forget as the Lightning uh, pulled off uh, the Game 7 win on home ice to capture their first Stanley Cup, obviously, in their 12-year history. Just a tremendous season from start to finish, the unbeaten start, little dip in the middle, a great second half. This season had all the elements. You know, the thing is, it's still very, very hard to sit there and say Stanley Cup champions. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It still hasn't really totally sunk in yet, but it's very hard to get this smile off your face as well. I think this is a, a season that... I don't think a lot of people really expected it. I don't even know if the players themselves expected it to be this great. I know the coaches were a little bit surprised that they went in and won the Stanley Cup, but I still think that when you take a look at this club and you really look back in retrospect, you can see that it was really starting to take hold in about the middle of the season, and it really took off from January on. Well, with all the great moments to relive with you here in our hour-long special, uh, let's start with Chief the Ultimate, Game 7 of the St. Pete Times Forum of the Finals. Well, I think a lot of people were we're really surprised that it, the, the series really got back to Tampa for Game 7, but then I think the Lightning really came out. I mean, we watched this club, Rick, time and time again really rise to the occasion. Vinny LeCavier was absolutely phenomenal in that game, setting up those goals. I think that winning goal set up to Ruslan Fedotenko was something that you see. Maybe the great players in their sports, the, the Michael Jordans, finally that, that comparison might have come true for the Lightning, but the thing of it is, is what really gets me is the fact that they really needed to win the game. They had all the confidence in themselves that they were going to win the game, and they went out and did it. And you look at what the Lightning accomplished against all odds. Another movie reference, Chief, but it's the kind <laughs> of script that only Hollywood, you would think, could come up with. But the Lightning down three games to two. They become only the fifth team in 66 years since the NHL's had a best-of-seven series for the finals to come back from 3-2 and win the Cup. You know, this is a thing that really amazes me. I, I, and throughout the whole playoffs, you and I both talked about it so many times, Rick, is the fact that, you know, there wasn't that total respect for this hockey club as we really went through this series and through all the series as a matter of fact and then finally when you take a look at what they accomplish obviously winning the Stanley Cup and and then but only the fifth team to come back as you said there that is just incredible this is a club that never ceased to amaze anybody and I don't think they can cease to amaze themselves because they did such a great job well they started their growth last year a 93 point season and a Southeast Division Championship started this year with an unbeaten start for their first eight games a dip in the middle but a big second half as the Lightning built toward the playoffs in their rise to win the Stanley Cup. We'll continue with more right after this. 
Welcome back to the Tampa Bay Lightning 2004 Stanley Cup Special here on Sunshine Network. Rick Peckham and the Chief Bobby Taylor with you. Paul Kennedy will be alongside in a few moments. But Chief, the, the Lightning's push for the Cup really started with the second half of the season. They'd had a tough time in the month of December and even got off to the start of the new year in rough shape. A, a 2 nothing loss at the hands of the Columbus Blue Jackets might have been the low point of the season. But from there, they really took off. I don't know what it was, Rick. I don't know what really kind of got their minds back on track, but I'm sure, uh, I, I think when I really go back, maybe even a little bit uh, further ahead, rather, when they lost that overtime game in Vancouver, and, and they really started to play some tremendous hockey there. They had that long road trip in Canada, and I think uh, Vinny LeCavier came out and said that he was going to have a better second half than the first half. In fact, he said he was going to have a great second half, and he really started to lay the groundwork there. I think the players were really upset with themselves, and I think they decided that you know what we're a much better team than what we showed in the month of December and we're gonna go out and prove it we have a good system we have good players all we have to do now is execute and that's what they started to do and the fact that a lot of these wins that we're watching highlights from came on the road remember what a difficult schedule the lightning had uh, in that month of January how much time they were away from home yet they kept winning night after night after night after they really got it rolling yeah that was the thing I thought was such a key factor to them because of the fact that they were able to put a lot of victories together on the road. Where it's very, very difficult in the way the situation, the way the NHL is set up now is the fact that you can't win too often in the other team's building and it's very, very difficult. Everybody really gears up for the home games and I think when the Lightning started to get those really strong road victories, in fact, what, they ended up with, what, 22 road wins over the course of the season. There was only two teams that ended up with more. It really showed, and at least I think it should have showed to everybody in this league that this was a team that was going to be reckoned with and boy I'll tell you what they just took it from there well, the calendar changed from January to February, but that didn't bother the Lightning at all. They had one regulation loss the entire month of February, Chief. What a month. You know what? It almost like when you're sitting there when you got your go your golf game rolling. All of a sudden, you just feel like you can't wait to get out there and play all the time. And that's exactly how this club really viewed this month. They couldn't wait to play. I think also, too, that it was because of such a, the travel schedule, Rick, I think that John Tortorella and his coaching staff gave them a number of days off so that they basically were just playing games. So that's probably whetted their appetite even more so they could get out there and play the games and get back on the ice. When you're rolling, when you're playing well, you can't wait to play again. And I think that's what really what took hold of this club in the month of February. Chief, I know your golf game. Maybe you've had that <laughs> feeling before, but I haven't. But this month of February, uh, you think back to around Christmas time, the Lightning had lost in Atlanta. There were eight points out of first place in the Southeast. During this month, I believe they had a 17 point lead on Atlanta and the rest of the Southeast Division uh, at one point during this month. That's how hot they were and uh, it really was a, a fabulous month for the Lightning uh, to roll into the month of March. You know, it's interesting. I mean, we've seen this club. We thought last year they kind of turned the corner and they did a very good job last year in going to the second round of the playoffs and then losing five to New Jersey. But I think at the start of the year, things became a little bit too easy for this club. And then that adversity in the month of December, I think, really really got them grounded. It put their feet back on the ground, they got their head out of the clouds, and they started to understand that if you're going to be successful in this league, you must play consistent hockey. <laughs> I don't think you could get much more consistent than they did in that month. Well, in March, it started out uh, very hot as well with uh, one of the biggest wins of the season, I thought, was the win in Colorado. Uh, this was just a tremendous goal by Vinny LeCavalier in that 3 nothing shutout. And it set up an opportunity for the Lightning to uh, actually clinch the Southeast title with 13 games to go. On March the 8th, they were obviously the first team to clinch a division crown in the NHL this season. You know, Rick, I think when you go through a course of a season, there's certain games that kind of tell you as a player and tell you as a team team just how good you're going to become. Obviously up until this point they had a lot of victories. They really felt that they were winning a lot of games, that they were a good team. But now you're going up against Colorado who everybody right from August on when they signed Solani and Korea thought was going to be the team to beat. And they went in there and they just handled Colorado easily. It was a 3-0 game. It should have been 7 or 8-0. Then they won that huge game in Toronto when they hammered the Leafs 7-2 at the Bell Center, or pardon me, at the Air Canada Center. 
And I think what really got me is that this team all of a sudden understood now that we can beat anybody. We can play with the best teams. We can beat teams that have given us trouble in the past years. And it was a tremendous thing. And, and it started, I believe, with that Colorado game because that was a, just a dominating victory. And now all of a sudden, you as an individual, you as a team think that, boy, I'm telling you, we're good. I'm good. This whole team's good. Well, you look at a game that the Lightning didn't win, the 1-1 tie with Detroit when they clinched the Southeast Division title. Uh, it was a game where they came in first in the overall standings. Detroit was number two, a big, big moment for the Lightning, and uh, they proved themselves against that team. You mentioned uh, the win against Toronto. They were beating teams that they never had beaten before, hadn't beaten in a long, long time. On the road, at home, uh, it didn't matter. They were getting points in a lot of different cities, and it really set them up. When you look at the standings, in the final Eastern Conference standings. Uh, the Lightning among six teams, the first time ever, with 100 points or more. That's elite company. The Lightning right there at the top. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, it's one of the few times, if not the only time, that you had six teams finish with 100 points. So it wasn't the fact that they had a, 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 a good year and everybody else had an off year. That was the thing. And you know, one of the things, too, that really impressed me about the, the victories this year was the fact that the team didn't rely on their goaltending totally to win games. We've seen that in the years past. If they were going to win, Habby Bullen or John Graham had to stand on their heads. I think this year, John Graham and Habby Bullen could take a lot of the nights off. Well, that number eight seed you saw in the standings, the Islanders faced the Lightning in the first round, and after a 1-1 split in the first two games, the Lightning took off with eight consecutive victories that carried them through the first two rounds and really set the stage for a monumental series against the Flyers in the Eastern Conference. Pro wrestling the way it should be is coming to pay-per-view. Welcome back, everyone. The Tampa Bay Lightning's 2004 Stanley Cup special here on Sunshine Network. Well, we brought you up to the Stanley Cup playoffs now after a brilliant second half by the Lightning. And, Chief, the Lightning played so many games in so few days down the stretch of that regular season. They still didn't have a whole lot of time to get ready for the Islanders, an Islander team that had beaten the Lightning three out of four times in the regular season. They came in with a lot of confidence. I was really concerned about this series, Rick. I thought this was the series that could really be the stumbling block for the Lightning in their quest to go deep into the playoffs. I thought this was a club that had a lot of confidence against the uh, Lightning. Uh, they came in there and they, as you pointed out, the Lightning only won one game out of the four. Uh, the first game was a, a very uh, uh, easy game. I shouldn't say easy game because the Islanders played pretty well, but the Lightning came around and, and got it. I think when they took the split in the, in the first two games, the Islanders very, very cocky sure of themselves that they were going to win this series and I think that was their downfall because the Lightning really came out and they really tried to do something different. They played the game the way they used to play the game throughout the whole playoffs or pardon me throughout the whole season and I think that was one of the things that made it so much more uh, of, a, of a victory because the Islanders really believed they were going to beat the Lightning and the Lightning were a little bit nervous and I think they were a little bit uh, apprehensive about this whole series and then all of a sudden Javi Bullen took over and the big players took over the, from there on and it was a very quick one. Well as we know the hallmark of this Lightning team is the fact that there were so many heroes night in night out different guys uh, multiple players uh, contributing in heroic roles. Tough to nail down uh, three guys as heroes from this series. Brad Richards also at five points in the five games, but Freddie Modine just a tremendous series. St. Louis with uh, the great goals, including that one where he picked the pocket of Kenny Onsen and Nikolai Javi Bulin, Chief. Three shutouts in five games. I mean, he was really on pace to set a new playoff record. I mean, I think, uh, you know, at that time, and I think when you take a look and I mentioned earlier in the show the fact that the Lightning didn't really rely on their goaltending to win a lot of their games this season and they didn't have to because they played so well but I think in the playoffs you really need to have your goalie be the best player and Habi Bull was the best player against the Islanders there's no question about it in my mind and I'm telling you that because I'm part of the union <laughs> <laughs> you goalies always stick together Jeez, we got to deal with this now in the summertime as well as the regular season in the playoffs but we'll get through it somehow if you two uh, can also hang with hang in there with me but uh, chief the Canadians came up next and this was kind of a, uh, a proving point for the Lightning because you'll recall they lost the second round last year. And the coaching staff, I think, was really interested to see how the hometown guys, the Le Cavaliers, the St. Louis, the Waz, and so forth, would react in playing against their hometown Montreal Canadian team. I think it really, the draw really helped the Lightning out. Uh, I don't think that uh, 
uh, there was going to be any doubt, at least there was it in my mind, Rick, and I know you didn't have that many doubts either because of the fact that Vinny LeCavier, uh, Marty St. Louis, and Brad Richards, who played junior hockey not too far from, from Montreal, really play their best games against the Canadians. They really seem to shine. And I think, you know, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, Vinny LeCavier had to beat Montreal because when he'd come home in the summer, he didn't want to take all that trash talking <laughs> to put up with for the whole, whole summer long, so he had to beat them. But I think this was really something that really showed the skill level of this hockey club. Uh, Montreal was a team that uh, wasn't a real physical team, but tried to be a physical team. They had some pretty good speed. Uh, they had some decent skill on their own time, but I think this was the one series that really shone for the Lightning. Their skill players really showed their skill. They showed their individual abilities, and I'll tell you what, it was a memorable four games. I think this is where the power play really came through as you look at the heroes from round two and LeCavalier obviously leading the way with the five goals and once again uh, the Lightning outscoring their opposition by a wide margin as they did in the first round but uh, Richie there with uh, the two game winning goals the big overtime game winner there in game three and uh, Marty not scoring a goal but he uh, figured in the scoring of a lot of uh, uh, scoring plays for the Lightning but uh, it seemed that special teams uh, became very important for the Lightning couple of shorthanded goals. Obviously, Stillman had a huge one there in Game 3. And uh, the power play really started to uh, make the Canadians pay for trying to, to play that physical style that you noted. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times, you know, we always talk about keys to games and keys to series and keys to success. And a lot of times, obviously, we start with goaltending. You know, your goaltender has to be a very, very good go player. Again. Here we go again. You have to have excellent special teams. Your power play has to really connect, I, I would say, close to 20%. Maybe you don't have to be at 20%, but you'd have to be pretty close to 20%. Your penalty killing has to be well over 85%, and then you're going to be successful. Well, I think this is one of the few times that we really were made to be uh, soothsayers, because it kind of worked out that way. The Lightning's power play, their specialty teams were extremely strong. The goaltending was very, very good. So I think when you take all that and put it into perspective and see it and put it in the pot, it came out with a victory. Well, next up, the Philadelphia Flyers in the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, the Lightning had beaten them four straight regular season. Coming off a, an 8-1 and one start in the playoffs, Lightning fans couldn't wait to get their hands on the Flyers here, Chief. You know what? It was unbelievable. This was a, a series that I think everybody was kind of looking forward to because I think people in Philadelphia thought they're finally going to go and end that drought. They're going to go to the finals. They're going to beat these young upstarts from the South. Uh, they thought they had the better team going at them. Um, I don't think that uh, they realized just the resolve that this Lightning Club had. We talked about the talent and the individual abilities of the players in the series against Montreal. I think now against this Flyer team, Rick, we saw the resolve, the grit, the determination, the courage, whatever, however you want to put it, and however you want to put a label on it, this is what I really found out about this hockey club, that they really had a lot of determination to play and to win. They were beat up, they were hammered in this series, they were really run at all the time out there by guys that don't usually play that way, and the Lightning kept coming back and coming back. They would lose a game, and they would come back and win the next game. This is what really proved to me that this was a tremendous team because they had it right here. They had the heart. Well, the Lightning did it the right way. They won the odd-numbered games, and uh, that kept them ahead through the series, and obviously won Game 7. And you look at these three scoring heroes. Uh, they averaged these three, two goals a game in the seven-game series with 14 goals, and uh, all the top six forwards really showed up. But, Chief, uh, one of the things that uh, you don't hear a lot about uh, from these lightning forwards is the fact that they play so well defensively that they're trusted to outplay whoever they're matched up against a Keith Primo uh, a Mark Recchi whoever was out on the ice against them in that series they outplay them at both ends of the ice you know one of the stats and I think a lot of times coaches will tell you that you know that plus minus stat is something that they really don't pay that much attention to that it is kind of misleading because you're playing against different players and sometimes you're put in different situations but I think it gives a pretty good indication just how committed you are to defensive hockey and at this point during the playoffs the Lightning had I think five of the top seven plus minus guys in the lead in the playoffs at this point against the Flyers so not only were they scoring all kinds of goals and they were getting the offense they were getting the outstanding defense that they needed to, to do to go up against a very very hard uh, defensive club like the Flyers 
Well, the joy from beating the Flyers in a seven-game series, a big game seven at the St. Pete Times Forum, gave way to the joy, to the realization that the Lightning were going to play for the Stanley Cup in the finals. And we'll be back with that in just a moment. We hope you're enjoying our look back at the Lightning's championship season, the Tampa Bay Lightning 2004 Stanley Cup Special here on Sunshine Network. And Chief, we've uh, reached the Stanley Cup Finals. The Calgary Flames, a team that uh, not too many people had followed closely all season long as they uh, went through the Western Conference beating one top team after another, all three division champions, and they came into the finals as a sixth seed from the Western Conference. The Tampa Bay Lightning found out very early on they were in for a battle. This was a club that had everything going from them. We talked about the skill level of the Canadians and the speed of the Canadians, and then we talked about the toughness and the resolve and the defensive play of the Flyers. Well, Calgary combined all of that into, the, into one team, and I think one of the things that uh, might have been a little bit of a detriment to the Lightning was the fact that the Lightning hammered them pretty easily in the only time they played them up in Calgary. I think it was 6-2 or something to that effect. And, and, and I think this was one of the things that was really, uh, I thought when the Lightning, when they came back, they got that split down here in Calgary. Lightning went back up there, regained the home ice advantage, and they felt like going into game five that they were going to win that one and then finish it off in game six. And when they lost game five, oh, all of a sudden, they were really kind of uh, in a bind. But I think this was a club that, uh, again, I point out to, that all year long, every time you have them dead and buried, the Lightning have always responded and come back with a tremendous effort and a tremendous victory. And it has always been uh, a different player, but it was, seems to me like the top six players throughout the playoffs, their best players, were always their best players. Most times you find, Rick, that you get sometimes you get a, an unknown guy or a guy of a lesser light that becomes true and becomes your big playoff hero. The Lightning's playoff heroes were their best players, and that really bodes well for this hockey club. And even uh, the support from uh, the guys on defense, Daryl Sedora, a big acquisition from late January. And uh, pairing with Pavel Kabina, he combined to help shut down Jerome Aginla in the, the final couple of games as the Lightning came back. Hobby Bullen, you mentioned the big players coming up big, starring in goal. But those goal scores, as you point out, really came through. And if you've noticed a trend, Brad Richards' numbers seem to grow with every round of the playoffs. <laughs> Marty, of course, some big goals in uh, Ruslan Fedotenko with that magical game seven. You know, and Rusty, obviously going with the, uh, getting that head smashed into the boards and coming out looking like a like was never going to come out of that injury and came come back and scoring the big winning goal in the Stanley Cup final game in, the, in number seven. Marty St. Louis, who really wasn't the big goal scorer that everybody expected to be throughout the playoffs, who became much more of a playmaker and really dished off very well, got big goals, though. That overtime game winner in game number six, I don't think you can think of a bigger goal that the Lightning have ever scored, other than maybe Futatenko's game winner in game seven. But that one in game six was the one that really put them into the position to win the Stanley Cup. That was a huge goal. So when you needed something big, you got it from your best players. No question. That goal saved the Lightning season for the opportunity to win in a Game 7. But yet, uh, you look at Brad Richards' production, so consistent throughout the four rounds, uh, leading the playoffs with 26 points, a new Stanley Cup record uh, with seven game-winning goals. And it really didn't take him that long to set that record, Chief, but uh, he was the uh, deserved winner of the Conn Smythe Trophy. Tremendous effort, and, they, and we, you know what? We were reiterating exactly what Brad Richards said about himself. He had a terrible playoff last year. He did not have, uh, uh, he was what, five assists, no goals. You couldn't even give him a call half the time in the games on there. He had a bad knee, which a lot of people didn't understand or didn't realize. But boy, what a turnaround this year. As you can see that, seven game winners, which is a new NHL record. Uh, you know, 26 points in 23 games. Uh, it, to me, it was just really someone putting his mind to it, saying that I am going to be the difference maker. I am going to be a guy that is going to be here and counted for at the end of this series, and he certainly was. Well, obviously, uh, Brad was featured prominently at the NHL award show two nights later after the Lightning had won the Cup, and uh, here is uh, one of his comments as he spoke with Ron McLean, the CBC host of that program. Tell us about the Conn Smythe Trophy. Did your family get a chance to share that with you? Yeah, it was funny because uh, Dad held it for probably 20 hours and uh, <laughs> took it home. Your dad, Glenn, eh? Yeah, he, uh, he took it home and uh, we had breakfast with it in the morning and, and uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, with 
a guy who waited 22 years, uh, he had the cup, so I had to settle for this, but it was pretty fun. Yeah. Hey, the breakfast thing makes sense. It's a replica of the Loblaws grocery store. <laughs> but uh, that's another story, as you know. Show us one thing. This is probably the most special part for Brad. If you go down the, the file that he's going to be, there's only six spots left, and then they'll have to, because uh, Beliveau, Jean Beliveau won it first in 64. But you're going to go right here next to J.S. Jaguar and look at the file. I don't know if we can get a shot of it. Probably not. But look who's, look who's on top of you. I know. That's, uh, I didn't even notice it, but uh, my teammates said that, Bobby Orr and Wayne Gretzky, uh, and they were, uh, they were looking at it going, wow, look at that. So that's when it felt pretty special. The other fathers of some of these stars uh, shared <laughs> the uh, trophy the morning after uh, with their famous sons. Gretzky, a two-time winner. Mario won it twice. Patrick, three times. And uh, obviously your old buddy Bernie Parada, two-time winner there too, Chief. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing. Uh, these are the players that really are the ones that help you win the Cup. And uh, obviously it takes you uh, 23 guys to do this, to make you a champion. But these are the guys that go a little bit above it to help you get there a little quicker. Well, two guys who go above and beyond the call of duty. Paul Kennedy and Mitch Rubenstein were at the awards ceremony. They spoke with the Lightning Award winners, and we'll hear from the likes of NHL MVP Marty St. Louis and others when we return on our show. Vote for me. Um, like it, this is probably, uh, obviously, besides the Stanley Cup, this is the, probably the trophy that I will probably remember and uh, cherish for for the rest of my life because like uh, the video said it's uh, voted by the, the people that play against you and play with you so uh, it's uh, I'm really honored the remarkable class of Martin St. Louis welcome back to the show I'm Paul Kennedy it's been my pleasure this year on Toyota Lightning Ice Time to join the very classy tandem of uh, Rick Peckham and Bobby the Chief Taylor and players like Martin St. Louis Chris Dingman uh, the checking forward for the Lightning had a wonderful joke that circulated through the locker room when they asked him what hockey player is going to win the triple crown this year much like uh, Smarty Jones the horse Chris firmly tongue-in-cheek said it's going to be Smarty St. Louis that he is going to win the Pearson he's going to win the heart as the Riders MVP in the Stanley Cup as well. This was one of the most highly decorated teams in the history of the National Hockey League, triggered in large measure by the remarkable play of the smallest man in uniform, number 26, and Martin St. Louis, who mere days after winning the Stanley Cup was honored by his peers and the fellow players in the National Hockey League, members of the NHLPA as the league's most valuable player. And standing in the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, here is what Marty had to say, looking back on what was an incomparable year for a little number 26. Two. I'd like to thank my teammates. Obviously, uh, this, is a, this is a great sport, but it's not a sport that you can do anything one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And uh, it's, the league is too good. You need the help of your teammates, your line mates. And uh, I definitely have that in Tampa Bay. Marty St. Louis, who scored 96 points this year to shatter Brian Bradley's uh, single season scoring mark set in the very first season of Tampa Bay Lightning play. Marty wears number 26, and having grown up in the suburbs of a Montreal, his boyhood hero, Mats Naslin, who starred for the Habs, the Canadiens, in wearing number 26, and has since returned home to his native Sweden. But uh, he was able to span the Atlantic on the particular night in which Marty put on a black tie to receive the Art Ross Award as the league's leading scorer. And here was where Marty St. Louis, as the uh, top scorer in the NHL, renewed acquaintances with uh, one of his all-time heroes in Mats Naslin. I know you've met as a kid. Do you want to ask a question to Mats? Well, Mats, uh, I think uh, one uh, year uh, we had the Humpty Dumpty practice at uh, the, the old forum because we were going to represent the Canadians at the Pee Wee tournament. And uh, you took some penalty shots on uh, our goalies, fi five shots. And uh, you gave me your stick, the white torso pole. And I lost it. I forgot it in a, in a, in a hotel and when I went to a youth hockey tournament. So I was wondering if I could get another one. <laughs> I don't think they make any tourists anymore, but I can give you some other sticks for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Marty St. Louis, when the team came through Boston earlier in the year, had given one of his own sticks to a young man by Ben Jolinas, who promptly uh, put it above his bed in his bedroom and said he only pulled it down for Game 7s. Uh, he took that Martin St. Louis stick down to watch Game 7 against Philadelphia and then had to go back and pull it down against the Calgary Flames in Game 7. Certainly brought the Lightning a lot of luck. 
From the Calgary Flames, Jerome McGinley, their great forward, was one of the finalists for the Hart Award as the most valuable player in the National Hockey League as selected by uh, the NHL Riders. The other finalist was the great goaltender and Martin Brodeur of the New Jersey Devils. He of 38 wins. It would be Marty St. Louis who would capture the Hart on this sterling night in Toronto. And here's what Marty had to say, adding the Hart to the Ross and the Pearson and the Stanley Cup. And the winner, Martin St. Louis. Thank you. Wow. Um, First of all, I want to congratulate all the nominees and the winners tonight, uh, especially uh, Jerome. Um, I had the opportunity to start my career in Calgary, and uh, I was very uh, fortunate to have a guy like Jerome around. Uh, I was a guy getting called up, getting sent down, and Jerome was a guy who, uh, who would take time and really come over and talk to me, and that really made me feel good. So thanks a lot, Jerome. And uh, I'm really... Marty as well, great, uh, great year, I mean great career, There's still many years to go and I'm really uh, pleased that in August uh, I'll be playing with you, not against you. Of course playing in the World Cup of course and representing their native Canada. On now to the uh, Lady Bing Award, Marty St. Louis was a Lady Bing finalist along with teammate Brad Richards and Daniel Alfredson, the captain of the Ottawa Senators, a, a very classy player there. You know by now that it was Brad Richards who won the Lady Bing. Earlier in the year they were talking to assistant coach Craig Ramsey of how do you win and want to win an award that is uh, honoring gentlemanly play in what is supposed to be a, a rugged sport. Uh, hockey played in the National Hockey League. And Craig Ramsey, Rammer, told his young protégés that any award associated with the NHL is very, very important. Wayne Gretzky won this award uh, five times. Paul Correa won it uh, three times. In fact, Wayne Gretzky won it for the first time, the first of his five, in 1980. And that was the year that the man who would win it this year was born. And Brad Richards, at the age of 24, balancing his con Smythe, is the most valuable player in postseason action, with the Lady Bing. G'day folks, good evening. Now hockey is all about action. A combination of speed, skill and physicality exhilarates both players and fans alike. Now in any game where emotions run high, sportsmanship and gentlemanly conduct, gentlemanly conduct are universally admired. Tonight's nominees show that hockey, at its highest level, transcends mere sport and can become art. And the Lady Bing Trophy goes to... Brad Richards. about that? Russell Crowe presenting Brad Richards with the Lady Bing. Somewhere between Gladiator and A Beautiful Mind, the gentlemanly play of the Lady Bing. A man who is a gentleman, of course, and represents the uh, code of chivalry. That is the National Hockey League is Tampa Bay's uh, head coach in John Tortorella, who I have often compared, and many would say this is a stretch, to Vince Lombardi. Both Catholic xenophobics, single of purpose and winning at a young age. Vince Lombardi was in his 50s when he won his first Super Bowl. Here was John Tortorella now at the age of 46 capturing the Stanley Cup and on this night in Toronto it was John Tortorella uh, selected over Daryl Sutter, his rival in the Stanley Cup Finals, the head coach of the Calgary Flames and Ron Wilson of the San Jose Sharks. It would be John Tortorella who would take home the Jack Adams Award as the league's uh, outstanding Head coach. I just want to make one point. I don't consider this an individual trophy. I consider a collection of people within an organization trying to find its way, trying to do it the right way. It starts with the leadership of our general manager, it works through the coaching staff, and then it falls on to the players. Uh, we have two here representing us tonight, and Marty and Richie. Uh, I have to say, my first run 
uh, with the Stanley Cup in four rounds to see what these players do. Uh, we can all say that it's difficult, but to be able and fortunate enough to be with them and to go through it with them and understand what exactly they do do, it was just fantastic. So this is an organizational trophy uh, for the Tampa Bay Lightning. I will accept it in behalf of the team in an organization trying to find its way and trying to do it the right way. So I thank you very much. Well, the, the way I got into it is uh, I was a lousy player playing in the East, old Eastern League and uh, never thought I'd stop playing. I was having too much fun and uh, uh, making a couple hundred bucks a week. And, th and then I blew my knee out and I, I couldn't play anymore and that's when I was asked to coach the team. So it was never really a, uh, a situation where it's all planned out. Uh, I didn't think I was going to stop playing in that godforsaken league. and. Uh, um, but then it just happened that way, and and uh, that's all I know. Uh, that that's all I have known. I, and since then, I've been coaching and, and been very fortunate, uh, really fortunate in some of the people and some of the breaks that I've gotten uh, uh, to get an opportunity to continue to grow as a coach. A portrait of single-minded determination. Uh, the uh, outstanding head coach, coach of the year in the National Hockey League. John Tortorella, one of the most highly decorated teams in the history of the National Hockey League. We continue to celebrate the Stanley Cup title of 2004. Rick and Chief return with more right after this. You're watching the Tampa Bay Lightning 2004 Stanley Cup Special here on Sunshine Network. Rick Peckham along with the Chief Bobby Taylor and Paul Kennedy has been voted onto the island. I feel like I've been promoted to the parent club here. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you with us, Paul. Absolutely. It's been a wonderful year. Now we can compare golf tans yeah. between the three. I think Chief wins uh, hands down. Yeah. How's the weather? <laughs> Chief was every ahead day. in February, I think. But uh, <laughs> this is one of our favorite parts of the show because we get to talk about our favorite moments from the playoffs and from the season and uh, certainly chief as far as you're concerned I I'm just gonna guess here now it's gonna be a goaltending moment am I right no you're not Rick oh. I'm telling you it's it's, it's an a, upset it is it is an upset I'm telling you it's I don't know why but it took place really early in the playoffs and it was in uh, game four against the honors this play by marty st louis when he stole the puck away from kenny johnson had him spinning like a barber pole out there and just went in and scored and that to me was what really started the lightning on their way to the going deep into the playoffs they were a little shaky they were a little unsure of themselves and then when louis scored that goal boy the team just took off from there and and, and kenny johnson's not chopped liver he's a pretty good player he certainly is and uh the fact that they were able to win both those games, not give up a single goal on the island, uh, that uh, really had to be a tremendous confidence boost at that point of the playoffs for the Lightning. It really was, and, and, and again, I mean, we've seen so many times throughout the course of this season the individual skills that these players possess, and we talked extensively about it against the Montreal Canadiens, but Marty St. Louis, I think there's been a number of times that he has brought me out of my seat and almost fell out of the booth a few times. That was one of them where I think you had to grab a hold of my belt. <laughs> <laughs> See what you miss, Paul, when you're not in the booth with us? I always us. thought Kenny Johnson was chopped liver. I don't, I, <laughs> my, mine might be, uh, given the fact that uh, Martin St. Louis, Vincent LeCavalier, and Brad Richards all had a history with Quebec, uh, the series uh, with the Montreal Canadiens, when the uh, Bolts had won the first two, we head up to Montreal, they're trailing throughout the night in there with about 17 seconds to go. Vincent LeCavalier uh, from Dave Anderchuk between the legs to beat Jose Teodor and then late Brad Richards off Teodor's pads and they had stolen that game. That was a remarkable finish. There was such drama. It has to be the loudest arena the Lightning played in, not only in the postseason, but throughout the regular season. And the Canadians trying to play the physical game, the four-checking game, take a page out of Tampa Bay's book. They were running Marty St. Louis. They were running Vincent LeCavalier, and the Lightning able to survive that first period. Now, sometimes my seat is not as good as your seat <laughs> at the games. But at the end of the game, they come off the ice, and in the hall, 
hallway and throughout the night the uh, Canadian fans have been going ole 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 throughout the arena and to hear the bolts come down the tunnel after they had scored in overtime to win it and they're going into the locker room going ole 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 <laughs> I was just it was a wonderful moment to be down there close to the dressing room so many moments to choose from it it's so difficult to nail it down to just one just to trim it to one and I'm gonna go with game seven guys uh, Vinny Le Cavalier of course in this series watch this move it's got every ingredient of Le Cavalier's game the vision the creativity the power to get through two flames to set up Ruslan Fedotenko's goal that turned out to be the winner in Game 7 in that 2-1 victory. But uh, the way that series had set up, it was Le Cavalier versus Aginla on an individual basis. They had a fight earlier in the series. And uh, at times, people were saying, well, Vinny's trying to play too physical because that obviously was the style of the Calgary Flames. Then he got back to being more creative. And it was back and forth, uh, Le Cavalier and Aginla, a tremendous one-on-one -on -one battle. And really, Vinny put it all together there and we've all all of us who've been uh, watching him for years since he came into the league in 1998 as the first pick in the draft have been waiting for the moment when this guy grows up and uh, becomes a man at 24 years of age as uh, a National Hockey Leaguer six years in the league to win a Stanley Cup and to make the big play that sets up the game-winning goal a tremendous shot by Ruslan Fedotenko of course but the Lightning go on to win the Stanley Cup and that was just a tremendous moment we're gonna see that highlight in Vinny Le Cavalier highlight packages for decades uh, to come. They're not going to show, though, he absolutely got killed after he gave that <laughs> pass away. If they carried it a little bit longer, you see that defenseman coming in there and just hammering him. So I think that's part of the replay that probably won't be seen, but I know Vinny Le Cavalier could still feel that bruise. And the great fight between he and again, a great fight is the two captains who rarely go going at it here. And I had an opportunity at the Hockey Hall of Fame at the ceremonies to visit with Jerome again. What a class person uh, he yes. is uh, away from the ice. And now the passion of the finals was over. It was a pleasure to be able to, to chat with him. Great representative of the Flames. Well, now here we are in the off season, following the victory about a month or so after the uh, Stanley Cup victory for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now the Cup is on tour. Well, where is it going to go? Well, Il Bazaar just outside of Montreal, Le Cavalier's hometown. Marty St. Louis, of course, uh, from Burlington, Vermont. It's where he spends his off season. He went to college at the University of uh, Vermont and met his wife Heather there. Uh, Brad Richards, his hometown. A lot of hometowns mostly for these guys, Chief. I'd love to be in Murray Harbor to see that celebration, I think, in PEI, you know, the potato capital of Canada. People don't understand that. Not only do they get lobster, but they grow potatoes there pretty well as well. You really? see Archangel yeah. Russia, they do grow potatoes. Yes, Arch they do. Archangel Russia, not much grows there. It's about a thousand miles <laughs> north of Moscow. But uh, Dmitry Afenosinkov, he's got married, he's had a baby, and now he's bringing the uh, Stanley Cup home. And what is the uh, magical roll-up, roll-up for the magical mystery tour here? How about in the States? Coming stateside here. Yeah, well, there's Marty in Burlington. He's also going to take it to his hometown of Laval, another Montreal suburb. But Dave Andrichuk, uh, he's got that cup more than anyone and is the captain of the team. He should, and after a 22-year wait, huh? Well, they have to have it surgically removed from his hip right now because <laughs> it's been there for the last three weeks, maybe even a month. But I think it's going to go to uh, to Idaho, or Iowa, excuse me. I don't know if the cup has ever been to Iowa before. You know, Russell and Fedotenko's taking it there. Well, why so. is he taking it there? Well, that's the city that he first came over from when from the Ukraine to play there. So there you go. Yeah. And then you see uh, the ones that's going to Canada, Perrin will get it in Laval as well. Um, and I think uh, Sidor has it twice. He gets it to Edmonton and Campbell. See, that's what happens when you have seniority. Boy, you get to go there a little more often than these young guys that don't get to have it that often. I can only imagine with Brad Lukowicz. Do you think that might end up in a pub as well with some oh. uh, heavy metal band in there? What about the Corey's, rock promoter yeah. that he is? Corey Sarge. He might even have to open up wine that has a cork <laughs> rather than a screw. <laughs> top, but yes, it's disgusting. I'm really kind of intrigued by John Graham taking it to Las Vegas after he goes back home to Denver. That's going to be very, very interesting. Austin makes it back. <laughs> yep. All these guys have big plans for their day with the Cup. The 2004 Stanley Cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning will be back with more here on Sunshine Network after this. The Cup championship in his 22nd season in the NHL. All the accomplishments, certainly those numbers alone will put him in the Hall of Fame, but uh, you 
just value what he meant to this team, guys, as far as uh, being the leader of this uh, organization in, in the dressing room and on the ice, and uh, you just can't measure it. You know, I keep thinking back to about two, t almost three years ago, Rick, when Jay Feaster came to him and said, I, c I can trade you to a contender. And I know the Montreal Canadiens were really after him. Uh, Doug Gilmore, his longtime friend and teammate there, wanted him to come to the Canadiens, and uh, he just said, no, there's something special going on here with the Lightning. I want to be around for it. And boy, was he ever a soothsayer. The man who instilled pride in the logo as you take a look at the unrestricted free agents that are coming, Jason Cullimore along with the veteran and Darren Rumble. You don't step on the logo, I learned that, in the Tampa <laughs> Bay dressing room here. And what a year that Cullimore had, Rick and Chief. He's a guy that they would probably really spend a lot of time trying to get signed. Uh, Darren Rumble, uh, as you see there, is mainly going to be a filling guy, I think, or, or really a strong guy that could use in Springfield. Uh, and then all the young guys, these are the ones that uh, you've got to give them an offer. I think you'd probably look at Corey Saric and Fedotenko possibly, and, and Fena Senkov. I think they really have high hopes for him. At least the coaching staff really, li really likes this young player. It's a deeper list in total of the restricted free agents. These are the prominent ones. Uh, obviously Obviously, Jay Feaster has said we're going to try to do everything we can to keep this group together, and uh, certainly he hopes to. However, the financial constraints of the business will uh, play a large part in that, plus the great unknown, uh, what happens as far as the collective bargaining agreement that will expire September 15th, and uh, just the future of uh, the sport, the immediate future, is uh, in doubt for everyone. Well, this is known, the fact that the two teams that went to the Stanley Cup Finals, and this plays to ownership and Commissioner Gary Bettman in the negotiation for the NHLPA that are forthcoming. The two teams that went were so-called small market teams and their payrolls, neither payroll was in the top 20. They made smart player decisions, did the lightning that took them all the way to the trophy. Well, so many great memories, yeah. Chief. You know what, I was just going to say that, Rick. You know, one of the things that this is going to be a year that nobody will ever forget. Uh, you and I have been here a long time uh, watching this club go through its uh, bad years and now they're really on top of the world and it really is very, very gratifying and uh, you can sit there and see these young players as they develop into the stars that they are. It's very, very, very gratifying for me to see that. Well, you think of that first practice with John Tortorella taking over as head coach in January 2001 to where this team finished up on January 7th at Stanley Cup Champions. The growth has just been tremendous and it's been fun to watch day in and day out uh, to grow along with these guys and learn what it takes to win the Stanley Cup. We know that you have enjoyed the Lightning's ride uh, for the Stanley Cup all season long and please check your local listings on Sunshine for uh, selected games to be replayed this summer as well and we look forward to seeing you on time <laughs> next season.